Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the sterile response or regulatory element binding protein pathway, or the SREBP pathway. Okay, right, uh, so what we've seen is that in low cholesterol levels, what will happen is the sterile regulatory element binding protein is produced and put into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. What then happens is you also produce the uh, sterile regulatory element binding protein cleavage activating protein, the SCAP, which will then bind to the sterile regulatory element binding protein. And that complex will then be um, put into COP2 coated vesicles, okay, so it will be budded off from the ER membrane and these COP2 coated vesicles will uncoat and then they'll fuse with the cis-Golgi membrane and that then results in us having this complex within the membrane of the cis-Golgi. So let's now remind ourselves of this complex. So, we firstly have the sterile regulatory element binding protein um, cleavage activating protein here which has this binding domain with which it binds to the sterile regulatory element binding protein at its carboxyl terminus, okay? And then the amino terminus is over here. So this is the SCAP protein. And now this binding domain here will be binding to the sterile regulatory element binding protein which also has a domain which will bind to this, okay, called the regulatory domain, and that is again at its carboxylic acid terminus. It then also has this important transcription factor domain, which is within the BHNH LZ family of transcription factors. Okay, and we'll come to that. So this complex is now within the membrane of the cis-Golgi. Now what's going to happen to it once it gets into the membrane of the cis-Golgi? Well basically there are two protease enzymes which are in the membrane of the cis-Golgi which are going to act on our sterile uh, regulatory element binding protein. So the first is called the site 1 protease. So let me draw this here. So basically this is again an integral membrane protein and I should just stress this is the cytoplasmic side of the Golgi membrane and this is the luminal side of the uh, Golgi membrane. Okay. Now, uh, this site 1 protease enzyme has its carboxylic acid terminus on the cytoplasmic side and then it has a special domain here before you have the amino terminus on the luminal side. Okay, so this enzyme is going to be called the site 1 protease enzyme. And for short, the site 1 protease is often abbreviated to S1P, okay, for site 1 protease. Now, what is this enzyme going to do? Well, it's going to basically cut the sterile regulatory element binding protein around here, okay? So it's going to cut the protein in half around here and therefore it cuts off the attachment to uh, the SCAP protein, okay? And it separates this little bit here, which has the BHNH um, LZ transcription factor here, okay? What now can happen is this little fragment that we've got here can be acted upon by a second protease, which is also in the membrane of the cis-Golgi, okay, called site 2 protease. So let's put this little fragment that we produce then, because this is the important fragment. This is the one with the transcription factor in, okay? This is now going to be acted upon by another enzyme called the site 2 protease. So the site 2 protease has a membrane-spanning topology that kind of looks like this, okay? It has four overall membrane-spanning alpha helices, but overall it has these two sort of little dips that sort of dip into the membrane but don't quite make it all the way through. So here's the amino terminus of the site 2 protease, and here's the carboxylic acid terminus. So this is site 2 protease. Okay, and site 2 protease, which is usually abbreviated to S2P for short, is going to cut the fragment of the sterile regulatory element binding protein within its membrane spanning alpha helix here. So it's going to cut there. So this is the site of action for site 2 protease. And what that will result in is this BHNH LZ transcription factor going off. So here we now have 
our BHNH transcription factor, our basic helix, loop helix, leucine zipper transcription factor going off into the cytoplasm and this will then make its way up to the nucleus and act on the nucleus. And what it's going to do is increase the expression of, um, well, of um, the LDL receptor to increase the absorption of LDL from the outside world to increase the amount of cholesterol we're getting being delivered to the cytoplasm of the cell via the absorption of LDL. And it will also increase the expression of the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme so that we can increase our de novo synthesis of cholesterol as well. Okay, so let's firstly start off with a basic um, discussion of what transcription factors do at DNA. And then we'll discuss what is meant by a BHLH transcription factor and what is meant by a leucine zipper transcription factor. So basically, if we have the DNA here, and I won't bother drawing it twisted up, okay, you have genes on the DNA, and it upstream of all eukaryotic genes, you have a region known as the promoter region. Okay, so let's say that this is the promoter region here. Now, the promoter region is not used itself for the translation process. So this bit will not be translated into actual protein. However, it is incredibly important in regulating the amount of the downstream gene that you actually t produce, basically. Now, how does it do that? Well, basically, in order to actually make the gene into protein, what you need to do is you need to get the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme binding to the DNA at some point, and then making its way along the gene to actually transcribe the gene, the coding strand of the gene, into a piece of mRNA. Now, basically, RNA polymerase 2 binds the promoter region and then starts working its way down the gene to produce this mRNA. The mRNA will then go and be translated into protein. So the affinity with which the uh, promoter region binds to RNA polymerase will determine how often the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region, and therefore it will determine how much of the gene is actually transcribed into mRNA. So it will determine how much mRNA you actually produce for this gene, because if this has a very high affinity for RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind there all the time. You'll get loads of mRNAs being produced, which will be translated into protein, and therefore you'll get a huge amount of protein for the gene being produced. Whereas, if the promoter region has a very low affinity for RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will hardly ever bind to the promoter region and therefore you'll get hardly any mRNA being produced and therefore very little protein. So a transcription factor then is something which binds to promoter regions uh, upstream of genes and alters the affinity of that promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2. Now, a single transcription factor can bind to the promoter regions upstream of a plethora of genes. Now, at some of those uh, promoter regions, the transcription factor will actually increase the affinity of the RNA polymerase 2 for binding to that promoter region. Okay, so it will enhance the uh, expression of the downstream gene. Whereas at other promoter regions, this same transcription factor will decrease uh, the affinity of the RNA polymerase 2 for binding to that promoter, and therefore it will decrease the expression of the gene, and it will repress the expression of the gene, therefore. So the same transcription factor will enhance the expression of some genes and repress the expression of other genes. So that's what transcription factors are going to do. So, the BHLH-LZ transcription factor that we have coming from our sterile uh, regulatory element binding protein, this is going to bind to the promoter region upstream of the LDL receptor gene and also upstream of the HMG-CoA reductase uh, gene, and it's going to increase the expression of those two genes so that you get more LDL receptor being produced, okay, and also so that you get more HMG-CoA reductase being produced. And the LDL receptor expression going up will mean that uh, we're going to absorb more LDL from the blood and therefore get more cholesterol coming in from the blood into that cell cytoplasm. And the HMG-CoA reductase going up within the cytoplasm means that we're going to have greater de novo synthesis of cholesterol. 
are okay. And both of these things should help to raise the cytoplasmic cholesterol level. Okay, right. So I then promised to tell you what is actually meant by BHLHLZ. Okay, so this is the most complicated bit. So, BHLH then, we'll start with what BHLH means. This isn't too difficult. Uh, so, it means basic helix loop helix. Okay, so this is just telling you what the transcription factor actually looks like. It's telling you you've got a basic alpha helix, so an alpha helix which has a lot of basic amino acids in. Then you've got a loop. And then you've got another alpha helix, which isn't basic, okay? So what you've got effectively is something that looks like this. This is an alpha helix, then you've got a loop, and then you've got another alpha helix, like so. So it will have a structure in that looks like that. Now, let's also talk about what LZ means. What does a leucine zipper mean? Well, basically, leucine zipper transcription factors Whoops, leucine zipper transcription factors generally consist of just a single alpha helix. Okay, so usually a leucine zipper looks like so. And these alpha helixes are generally have a huge number of basic amino acids in, so amino acids which are capable of, of receiving a proton rather. Now, leucine zipper transcription factors usually work as dimers. So you usually get two of the transcription factors coming together, and then this dimer will function. In a BHLH leucine zipper transcription factor, what you do is you have a transcription factor that looks like this. So it is a basic helix loop helix, but these basic helices that each BHLH LZ transcription factor has will also dimerize like the leucine zipper alpha helices, and then this portion will act as the active transcription factor. So basically, BHLH LZ transcription factors do act as uh, dimers, basically. Okay, so let's say this is the, well, actually, let's say this one here is the basic helix, and this is the normal helix. Okay, and what will happen is this one will dimerize with the basic helix of another one of these transcription factors. And then here is the normal helix of this second BHLH transcription factor. And now this dimer of the basic helices is going to act as a leucine zipper transcription factor. So that's why it's called BHLH leucine zipper transcription factor, because it's basically both of them at once. Okay, right. So, that's how, basically, if cholesterol levels are low in the cell, you're going to increase the uh, absorption of cholesterol via the absorption of LDL, and also the production of cholesterol de novo, okay, through the biosynthetic pathways. What we now want to discuss is how does this not get activated when you have high cholesterol. So, let's say cholesterol in the cytoplasm is currently high. Okay, what basically can happen is the cholesterol molecules can bind to the sterile regulatory element binding protein cleavage activating proteins when they are in the ER membrane. Okay, right. So, when there was low cholesterol, this didn't happen, so the scap did not get cholesterol bound to it. So, here is our scap here, and now what's going to happen is when cholesterol is high, cholesterol is going to bind to this SCAP protein. Okay, so you'll have high cholesterol in the ER membrane if cholesterol is high in the cytoplasm. Okay, so if the cell's uh, cholesterol content is high, then it will have a lot of cholesterol in the ER membrane. The cholesterol in the ER membrane will bind to the SCAP protein here, the sterile regulatory element binding protein cleavage activating protein. And then what this promotes is it promotes the binding of the scap to another protein, which is called an INSIG, okay? So I'll put this here. So this INSIG protein has six membrane-spanning alpha helices, and it is always present within uh, the ER membrane, okay? So this is called an INSIG protein. And you might be wondering, what does INSIG stand for? Well, basically, it stands for insulin, that's the INS, Induced, that's the I, and then gene protein, that's the G. So this stands for the insulin, and then we've got induced, and those will have a dash between them, insulin-induced gene protein. 
Okay, so this is the INZIG protein. And basically, you always have INZIG proteins within the ER membrane. And when the SCAP binds to a cholesterol molecule, INZIG can suddenly bind to the SCAP protein. And really, I should have drawn it on this side because it actually binds to this side. Uh, so <laughs> let me just... It's going to bind to this side of the SCAP protein. And basically, what the binding of the INZIG does to the SCAP protein is it doesn't stop it interacting with the sterile regulatory element binding protein. This can still interact with the sterile regulatory element binding protein. What it does do, however, is it stops the SCAP from being able to interact with the components of the COP2 uh, machinery. Okay, so it stops loop 6 from being able to interact with SEC24, and therefore it stops the SCAP from being able to be, end, well, budded off into a COP2 coated vesicle, so it stops the SCAP taking the sterile regulatory element binding protein to the cis Golgi, basically. It traps the SCAP in the ER membrane, and therefore the sterile regulatory element binding protein also remains within the ER membrane. So that's when you've got high cholesterol within the cell, and therefore you've got a lot of cholesterol molecules in the ER membrane, which bind to SCAP. The SCAP then is able to then bind with an INZIG protein. The INZIG protein stops the loop 6 from being able to interact with the COP2 machinery, and therefore SCAP is trapped within the ER membrane, and therefore it can't move the sterile regulatory element binding protein into the cis Golgi. You don't get the sterile regulatory element binding protein acted upon by the site 1 and the site 2 proteases, therefore you don't get the release of the basic helix loop helix leucine zipper transcription factor, and therefore you don't get an increase in the synthesis of the LDL receptor or the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the SR-EBP pathway.